looks like a uh, hyacin implant. Now, the implant here, you can see that there's a little bit of bone resorption around the neck. As much as these things are designed a certain way, uh, you almost can't get away from the biological events that happen, whether it's caused by bacteria, whether it's caused by biomechanics. Uh, there's too much guesswork as to trying to understand exactly what might be happening when an implant looks like it. It's not failing, it's a little bit in the ailing stage of things. And so you can't expect the dentist or anybody, uh, specialist or not, really understand exactly how come the bone is going a little bit in like this or the facial plate. Even with my treatment assessments beforehand, it only helps you so far. But you can see here's where the bone kind of comes down. We'll look at it closer in the CT in a second. But let's look at the treatment assessment when we start this off as usual. And we have a green, light green bone density. We have a facial bone that is on the orange and a bone constriction that is orange and an IA nerve position that's orange. And the other one's uh, yellow for detached gingiva and the bone characteristics in, a, in the ridge height is at a light green. So let's just take a look at it and see what we can learn from this case. Okay, let's look at the CT here. This is what the CT looks like here. Uh, and you can see that bone height going. Let's see if we can make that more contrasty. So maybe you can see that now a little bit more clearly how it just dips down, just coming to the first thread. We have this nice implant that I like a lot, um, but it has this little switching here. So, you know, is it the contour coming off the implant head or is it the crown? You can't blame everything, you just don't know. Is it the occlusion? Could be biomechanics, not really sure. Let's look a little closer at the implant here um, and see what we can find out. We have some more facial bone loss here, but we have it maintaining on the lingual side here. This could have been placed deeper for sure. Uh, it looks like the nerve is probably further down here. So, it looks like um, this could have been buried more, but the problem is this was probably placed at the top of the crest of the bone, which is what the manufacturer recommends. So do dentists like to go against what the manufacturer recommends? Typically not. So that's the proper placement, which makes sense. And over time, there's a slight amount of bone loss. Is this patient going to lose the implant anytime soon? Definitely not. Is it a real problem? Not so much, no. Um, will there be more bone in the future? Maybe. Uh, so there's a lot of unknowns here going into this uh, and predictability, and this is where it is. There might be bone growing right here. that uh, looks great in the mouth. You can't tell anything. So he's gonna have a lot of stability. He's got a properly placed crown. He's got a nice, uh, you know, compressive load here going on. So there isn't any real, you know, straightforward reason why there's this bone loss that's occurring over time. Um, if we look at his other natural teeth, like I said, let's go into the treatment assessment kind of thing. Let's go to the tooth next door. And this might be a little bit of a clue here as to if this is the facial plate here, we have very straight parallel walls this looks pretty strong, um, but as we go along, we can see that we're going to get very thin. See the anatomy here goes in and goes up, and it's very similar to what the anatomy is on the first premolar here, where it kind of comes up like that as well. So, you know, here's a facial plate on an upper that looks pretty robust overall. Some areas are much thinner than that. And if we look at the edentulous site in the front, we definitely see that we've had a lot of resorption across the facial plate of those teeth that are originally there. So this is not an implant site and the, and the doctor did a uh, bridge or a Maryland bridge across that. Um, here on a natural tooth, he's losing some bone here, has probably gum tissue attachment. It's hard to say, but he's definitely coming into the 50-50 zone of how much tooth structure is actually in 
the uh, bone and how much is out. So he is slightly losing bone overall on his natural teeth, so it doesn't seem totally far-fetched that he's going to be losing some bone around the implant tooth as well. Um, his overall occlusion is not too bad. He's got some chipping on the anterior here, a little bit here. Um, it's a little bit hard, but he doesn't quite have the full occlusion here because he is kind of missing this premolar. This should have been a premolar and there should have been a molar right here. So this should have been over more um, in my mind and possibly uh, done a longer implant here and done one here. So he should have probably have done two, but on the upper, he also has premolar molar. So he's lost his premolar somewhere down the road. So this is, this is okay for his mouth. This was properly restored for his mouth, not somebody else's. Um, and uh, the overall results are great. I mean, he's been chewing on this. If he gets the next 10 to 20 years, uh, that would be great. Orthopedics only look at 10 to 15 year lifespans for, ten, for knees and hips. So why would we expect anything more from a even harsher environment for dental tooth implants? Um, I don't think that's fair but people seem to think it's got to go a lifetime. But anyway, he will definitely get his 10, 15 years out of it, and it'll work great in his occlusion and work uh, just perfectly fine. So um, that's about it for this little retro project. Um, he just did some other things, I don't remember what it is, but we'll take a look. Maybe a week from now, we'll go over to Richard Bell. So anyway, like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and